Okay. So, uh, as you know, in the last uh, session, uh, we we discussed about uh, some uh, basic information about um, about operating guidelines. We discussed about operating guidelines. Uh, besides operating guidelines, we also did some other uh, important things belongs to uh, last uh, session. So yeah, uh, first of all, we discussed about what is the meaning of uh, financial accounting, right? Then we discussed about uh, contractual framework. So in contractual framework, we discussed about uh, different kinds of uh, accounting uh, standards. So what is the meaning of accounting standard and how many types of accounting standards uh, we have, like as uh, America, so known as the American accounting standard, known as the oldest uh, accounting standards, all right? So which known as GAAP, generally accepted accounting principles. Besides that, we discuss some other accounting standard like as international accounting standard, also known as uh, IFRS, International Financial Reporting Standards. Then uh, we also discuss about Vietnam accounting standards, right? So these are the things that we discuss about con con uh, conceptual uh, framework, right? Besides conceptual framework, uh, we also uh, talked about some other things related to accounting standards. That means why we must have accounting standard or what are the qualities of accounting standard uh, we must have. So we discuss about objective of financial reports, uh, which is relevant, reliable, comparable, and consistency. Then uh, uh, qualitative characteristics, elements, and operating guideline. So operating guideline, the thing, that we did, we, we did not cover in the last session. So that's why in the last session I said that in the next session, which is today's session, uh, we will discuss about operating guidelines. All right. So let's, uh, let's start with the operating guidelines. <clears throat> this operating guideline is a combination of three different kinds of things, right? Now, first of all, what is the meaning of operating guidelines? The purpose of operating guideline is, keep in your mind, when we are preparing financial reports, we have, when we are preparing a financial report, then we have to keep in mind some other things. All right, which are important. So with the help of operating guidelines, we can understand which rules, regulation, or instruction we have to keep in our minds when we are preparing financial reports or financial accounts, all right? So that's the purpose of the guidelines. So this is kind of guidelines, all right? Which is help us to prepare accounts. So if we do not have that kind of guidelines, maybe, our financial reports may not be relevant, reliable, which means useful. It will not be useful because that information may not be true and fair, all right? That's why in order to maintain or enhance the quality of financial report, we have to follow certain guidelines. So in this operating guidelines, we're gonna discuss these kinds of guidelines, all right? So these guidelines, is a combination of three different kinds of elements. The first one is assumptions. We have to keep those assumptions in our minds when we prepare financial accounts. Second thing is principles. We have to follow some principles, right? And third one is a constraint. Constraint means some, some kinds of uh, limited things that you can change as per your situations, right? As per the quality 
or as per the characters of your organizations or as per the situation or circumstances that company faces at the time of preparing financial reports. All right. So let's start with the first one, which is assumptions. All right. So first guideline is assumptions. So I repeat, these operating guidelines divided into three parts. So I write here just to get the ideas. So three parts. First one is assumptions. All right. Assumptions. Second one is principles. Principles. And third one is constraint. All right, constraint. So we will discuss all these three things, all right? So let me explain you first, what is the meaning of assumptions? What is the meaning of principles? And what is the meaning of constraint? What is assumptions? Assumptions says that we have to keep in mind some kind of foundations of accounting that require us to prepare records. All right, I repeat, assumptions give us some kind of foundations that we require Foundation means fundamentals, basic things we need to know when we are preparing financial records. So assumptions providing us basic informations. All right, providing us basic information, requirements or guidelines that we need it, All right? Or we can call it these assumptions giving us some kinds of foundations that foundation are required to follow accounting process all right that's the purpose of the assumption so we have uh, uh, four kinds of assumptions all right so we will discuss four kind of assumptions next one is the principles what why we need a uh, principles accounting principles right principles explain that how transactions how transactions and events should be recorded should be recorded. That's principles are saying. So in other words, we can say that if any transaction occur in our organizations, how we can record these transactions. These kinds of information comes through the accounting principles. All right. And third one is Constraint. Constraint basically, okay. This constraint is giving you some kinds of freedom, right? Is giving you some kinds of freedom or some kinds of flexibilities in your accounting standards, right? Like you know that. Uh, in the previous session, we learned that uh, all the companies, they must follow accounting standards, right? Must follow means accounting standard. Of course, we have to follow all the assumptions, all the principles. But the good thing about constraint is that we don't have to strictly follow accounting standard. We have uh, some kinds of flexibilities or freedom to make a decision, your own decision, whether you want to follow or not. All right. But make sure that flexibility 
or freedom uh, do not giving any kinds of negative impacts or significant impacts on shareholders decisions for example i want to record so some information or some dollar value and the dollar value is really small let's say one or two dollars now it's completely my freedom whether i want to record this one dollar transaction in my accounts or not because if i will not record this one dollar transactions it may not give significant impacts on shareholders value so that's the example of the of some kinds of freedom or flexibility all right so freedom flexibilities means constraint so in other words we can say that it's uh, it's provide us a uh, permits it's giving some kinds of permits to all businesses entities or companies to all businesses to modify accounting standard to modify accounting standard but make sure that modification do not do not minimize the usefulness of usefulness of financial information all right i if i don't have to 100% follow the accounting uh, standards i can skip something i can miss something i can ignore it but make sure that ignorance do not reduce the quality of financial information it's keep maintaining financial information right so this kind of constraint cover two different kinds of things one is a materiality and second one is a conservatism so we will discuss later that materiality and conservatism this is the ideas behind the meaning or the logic of these operating guidelines assumptions which is based upon foundations right principles which is based on recording how we record the information so we follow the principles and third thing is a constraint kind of flexibilities or modifications in accounting standards that you can make it by yourself all right so this is the ideas behind operating guidelines so in today's session we will discuss these operating guidelines all right so we have four assumptions three principles and two constraint so total we have nine guidelines all right that nine guidelines we have four here three here and two here all right so let's start with the first which is assumption all right <clears throat> so a assumptions so the first assumption is a monetary units assumption monetary unit assumption sometimes we call it money measurement assumptions right what this assumptions about these assumptions basically says that any kinds of transactions or any kinds of events which does not have money value we should not record that transaction in our accounts all right so idea is monetary means money money related economic value related so idea is any kinds of 
events or any kinds of information events or activity or information which has money value which means dollar value right which has dollar value must be recorded all right must be recorded something doesn't have dollar value all right that should not be recorded all right so let me give example so information about people or employees people who are working in a company or let's say employees or workers All right now so i am giving you two kinds of information here All right and then you have to find out that which information we should record All right first information is how many workers or employees in a company are foreigners how many foreigners are working in a company and in this foreigners how many males and how many females all right second information is salary of employees how much salary or money we are paying to these employees all right these are the informations all right these are the informations we have so now the question is which information has a money value or which information has a monetary unit which one how many foreigners or salary of employees or both tell me quickly tell me a or b a or b which has a money value both or a or b so better you speak instead of just typing it's just a waste of time to check your message right. so next time please say just speak all right you don't have to type so because i have to open window and just take, take time all right so you said b all right yeah that's right b has a monetary value all right that's more belongs to financial informations all right i'm not saying how many foreigners are not important information that's may important for management accounting point of view for research point of view but from financial point of view salary of employees are known as monetary related information so we should record that's if you don't record it doesn't affect the profitability or financial information of company it will not be affected but if you will not record the salary financial information may not be fair may not be unbiased right so that's why we should record any kinds of any anything that we can any action events activity information that we can measure in terms of money we should record something we cannot measure in terms of money or which does not have a monetary value emotion feelings right that doesn't have a monetary values so we should not record it all right that's the ideas behind a monetary units all right next one number 2 number 2 is a business entity assumptions business entity assumptions right now what is business entity assumptions 
according to business entity assumptions, business, all right, business and the owner of the business, business and the owner of business are not same. They are different from each others. They are different from each others. They are not same. They will not be treated as the same, all right? Let me give example. For example, owner of the business, he or she went out with friends and family and spend around $1,000 for dinners, all right? Now the question is, so this person, the owner of the business spend $1,000 for his personals, for his personal purposes, could be friends, family, or anybody else, all right? Now the question is, can we record this $1,000 as an expense or as a cost in company? Can we record yes or no? Say something. Can I record this $1,000 as a business expense? Can we record yes or no? Quickly say something. Can we record this expense as a business expense? And can I record this one in my company accounts as a cost? Say something. Just speak. You don't have to raise hands. Just no, speak. sir. I think no, sir. No, we don't have to records. Why? Because? Because it's not related anything to the business. Exactly. That's the meaning of business entity, which means owner personal expense is not business expense. Owner personal activity, personal income, personal expense is not a business expense. Business income, business expense is not a owner expense not a honor expense, All right? It's not an honor expense. Let me give example. For example, business. We spend $1,000 for raw material means cost. So now question is, this cost must be paid out from business income or must be paid out from owner personal income? The answer is, it must not. It must not be paid by the owner of business because it's a business expense, right? It should not be treated as an owner personal expense. We have to keep them separate. All right, business assets is not owner personal assets. If business has a land, building, plant, machinery, these are the business assets. So owner of the company cannot use that assets for his or her personal purpose. No, because it belongs to business, All right? Owner personal expense, personal liability, personal loan, personal obligations must not be paid by a company, all right? That's the meaning of business entity concepts. Owner and the owner of business, they are not same. They are separate from each others. I don't know, do you remember 
uh, uh, the meaning of company. I don't know, you remember the meaning of company or not? Maybe you study in some subjects, but if you do not know the meaning of company, I tell you, company is a separate legal business. All right, that's the meaning of company. Company is a separate legal business with group of people. Their objective is to make money, all right? Now, the thing is, what is the meaning of separate? What is the meaning of legal? And what is the meaning of business? You know, business means involved in buying and selling goods and services, all right? Legal, legal means business must be legal, which means business must have license. If you have a license, your business is legal. If you don't have license, your business is illegal, right? Now, what is the meaning of separate? Separate means exactly this thing. We also call it separate entity concept or business entity uh, assumptions. So separate means business and the owner of business, they are not same. They are separate from each others. That's the ideas of business or companies. All right. So everybody understand business entity concepts. Say something business entity. Move on. Move on to the next. Again, you are typing, don't type. Just speak, say yes. How about unseparating? I didn't understand what you mean by unseparating. Okay. Um, let me explain you something. Business, remember, business divided into three parts. I hope you know that. If you don't know, so let me explain. Business divided into three parts. Sole trader, all right? Partnership, all right? And company, all right? So sole trader means business done by one person. We call it self-employment, all right? Partnership, business done by two people, all right? At least. Company means separate legal entity. So you can see that sole trader and partnership less likely to be known as separate entity. Maybe they are legal entity, they are legal business, that's fine, but they are not separate because in, or in sole trading business, whatever is your business assets, you can use it as a personal asset. Nobody will stop you. Same thing in the partnership. If two partners, they are agrees to use the business assets, no problem. But in company, you cannot use your personal assets. I mean, business assets. Who will stop you? Shareholders, All right? They will not allow you to use company assets as a personal assets because shareholders, they put money in a business to make money they did not put money in a business so the owner of the business can use that money for his or her personal purpose all right that's the reason that i hope that's the answer of your question is unseparating which means not separate so this and this business they are not separate maybe or maybe not but mostly not but company must be separate must follow business entity assumptions, all right? That's the ideas behind uh, business entity, right? So now move on to the third one. So third one is a time period. Time period. Time period means company must provide information 
to users on timely basis all right timely basis following following artificial period all right so in simple words company must provide financial information to users time to time not just at the end of the year all right you know that when we prepare financial reports we prepare financial reports for 12 months so which means at the end of the year after 12 months which is at the end of the year company produce financial reports all right that's that's very general ideas of the financial information that users get but in fact when company providing information to financial users company do not just provide information at the end of the year company provide information on timely basis which means company provide information to users time to time that time to time could be monthly monthly report could be quarterly report and yearly reports so most most of the time company provides quarterly every three months every three months company announce its profitability or financial situations to the users so users can make decision time to time but if you are pro waiting for 12 months and then you are providing 12 months informations to the users that's may may too late for users to make a right decisions all right three months whatever situation you give next three months three months three months and when you prepare financial report you combine all four quarters into one report that's called yearly reports but the idea is this monthly and quarterly period known as artificial period all right that's known as artificial period so we are providing information to users on timely basis so they can make right decision on right time because information has a value information has a life after that particular life the value of financial information goes down right don't let users wait too much to get company financial information time to time three months period is not uh, is not uh, is not too late all right like as you when you are studying you receive your results after one semester semester by semester you get the results of your particular subjects and then you make a decision uh, if you pass move on if you unfortunately fail then you have to reset all right you're not going to get the results of of all subjects in the final year no you receive information time to time and final year university combine all results and put in your in your in your uh, transcripts all right exactly here company providing information to users on timely basis and then at the end of the year that timely basis information company combine it and put in one financial report this is called yearly financial reports or annual reports or annually financial reports right that's the ideas behind timely period assumptions all right now move on to next still we are talking about assumptions so assumptions uh number four because assumption ha has a four uh different uh, guidelines right so number four number four is going concern assumptions going concern 
assumptions. Right? Now, what is going concern assumptions? It means, let me explain you the meaning of this and then I'll explain you what does it mean. Going concern assumption means, uh, it says that business will continue long enough so it can achieve its objective. Business will continue or carry out on the assumptions that business will going on. Okay. Now, what does it mean? In simple words, when we start business, what we assume? We assume that our business will be going on in future. We don't assume that after 5, 10, 15, or 20 years later, business will bankrupt. Do we assume that? No. We never ever assume that kind of, uh, we never keep that kind of assumptions in our minds. What assumptions we, 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 we use in our minds, we keep in our minds? We keep assumptions that our business will going on in future. It will be keep going on. We never think negative that after six months, my business will bankrupt, right? We always keep the positive uh, aspects or positive uh, point of view towards our business. That's the meaning of going concern. So always keep in mind that our business will going on in future. On the basis of these assumptions, we record informations that have an output or results or belongs to future. Let me give example. The example is a uh, depreciation, right? I hope you all know depreciation. Depreciation means the value of machine or value of any kinds of assets, which is machine in nature, goes down time to time. All right, means after a particular period of time, the value of machine will goes down. So what we do, this depreciation we record on timely basis, which means we record depreciation time to time. This is the first year. We're not gonna record all the depreciation in first year, all right? We record in first year, second year, third year, fourth year, fifth year. Let's say five years is the life of the machines, all right? So, Instead of recording all today, we are recording on timely basis. Why? Because we believe this is second year, third year, fourth year is a future. So we believe in future business will going on. On the basis of these assumptions, we record depreciation over the period of time. That's the assumption we have to keep in our minds. Let me give another example, going against some assumptions. Another example is buying assets. What is the purpose to buy assets? The purpose to buy assets is to take economic benefits of that assets in future. Let's say I am buying a machine today. Why I'm buying a machine today? Because I know in future, in future, that machine will give me benefits, economic benefits. That means that machine will give me profit in future. All right. So I am investing in assets today to get benefits in future. So I am thinking about that I will make money in future 
I will not bankrupt in future. All right. So, so that's the ideas behind it. That's the ideas behind going concern assumption. We believe our business will going on in future on the basis of these assumptions. We contact with the people. Uh, uh, we, we comes in a different con a different uh, different contract. It's exactly like as our personal life assumptions. We assume our life will be going on. We're not gonna die tomorrow. Of course, we die one day, but that day is not exactly tomorrow, which is Sunday, right? So by keeping that that assumptions in our minds, we involve in multiple things that will give us results in future. Let's say we are studying means when I graduate in future, I have a job. I'm not, I'm not thinking that why I need to study now because I'm going to die in future. I'm not, we are not thinking. We keep the positive thing in our mind. That's why we are investing our time and money in the different things. Business is doing exactly the same thing. All right. So that's all about the assumptions. All right. So assumptions finish. So four assumptions we studied. Money measurement, all right? All any kinds of information that do not measure in money, we should not record. Second one is a business entity, economic entity, or separate entity, all right? So which means business and the owner of business are separate. They are not same, all right? Third is a timely period or time period assumptions, which means company must report its financial information on timely basis following artificial period. So in simple words, company must provide information to users time to time. Don't take too long to provide financial information to users. Otherwise, that information will not have any economic value information may not have any significant value, right? And the fourth one is a going that's an assumption that business will be going on in future. That's why a company involved in any kinds of activity that may have output or results in future, all right? So that's the ideas behind assumptions. So assumptions are finished. Now we move on to B, operating guideline, which is principles, all right? Which means how transaction must be recorded, all right? What we have to keep in our minds when we are recording transactions, all right? So the first principle is a revenue recognition. Revenue recognition, right? Now, what does it mean revenue recognition? Revenue recognition means we must record the revenue when it's actually earned, all right? We must record the revenue when it's actually earn not actually received All right we must recognize revenue or we must record revenue in our accounts when it's earned not when it's received there's a difference between earning and receiving 
All right, let me give you an example. For example, you sold product. You sold product to customer on credit. We call it credit sales. We call it credit sales. Credit sales means you sell product or service now but receive money later. You sell product now, I'm selling you product now, but you pay me later, you pay me next week, all right? So you become my, you became accounts receivable. So account receivables are the customer from whom we need to receive money in future, in future. So let's say, let's say I sell you product, sold you product now, sold you product today. The value of product is $1,000, all right? And you said you will pay me money after two months. So let's say you said it, you will pay me money in July. All right, after two months. Now the question is, so I will receive cash in July. Now the question is, I should record these sales today because I earn, or I should record the time when I receive money? The answer is today. Earning is important than receiving, right? Earning is important than receiving. So that's why when you sold product, even though you haven't received cash, you should record your sales, means your sales increase. But when you receive cash, then your sales not increase, your cash increase. There's a difference between sales and cash. Right? Sales belongs to income statement and cash belongs to current assets. That's, that's I explained you in the last lecture, All right? So that's the ideas behind revenue recognition uh, principles, all right? It must be record the time it's earned. That time we have to record. If it's not, if income hasn't earned, it shouldn't, it will not be treated as income, all right? It will not treat it as an income. Like sometimes some people, they give you money in advance. They pay you money in advance. So when you receive that money, you will not treat as an income. Right. You may treat as an earn, earn, earn income, but at the same time, it will treat it as a liability. But the idea is that earning is important than receiving. Right. Let me give you another example. Another example is a contract. I think that's the best example. For example, let, let me give example of um, Metro Rail. That's uh, that's now uh, we are building in, I mean, government is building in Ho Chi Minh City and Hanoi. All right. So for example, I'm a contractor. I took a contract, which is, I don't know, let's say $150 million contract to build a metro rail in Ho Chi Minh City and in Hanoi. All right. I, I received this money for full contract. So which means I signed contract with government that I received, I mean, I built that metro in 10 years, right? And I am preparing my financial reports year by year, one year, two year, three, four, so on, all right, until 10. Now the question is when I'm recording my first year, I am preparing my income statement for first year. Income statement means sales minus cost, all right? 
So let me write sales minus cost is profit. So this is my first year income statement. So the question is how much sales I should record in first year. Should I record 150 million all here? If I record 150 million all here, I have nothing to record here. Or I record equally. That's not fair too. So how, how much revenue or sales I will record in my first year income statement? Answer is the revenue will be recognized on base of your cost. How many percent cost already occur? So let's say I am planning that total cost of, of this building metro will be, let's say, 100 million is a total cost. All right. So what I'm going to do, I will estimate that how much cost occur for this year. So let's say this year, my cost is 10 million. So 10 million divided by 100 million, which is 10%. So my revenue first year will be 10%. So means on the behalf of cost, I will recognize my revenue. I'm giving you example of the contract. If you receive a contract, all right, if you receive a contract, the situation where you are receiving all money in advance, even though, even though you haven't performed the service, in normal case, you perform service, you earn money, very general examples. But this contract is an exceptional case. That's, that's also happened. Like as I give example of the, of the Metro Rail, all right? So this is the ideas for revenue recognition. All right, this is the way that we, we recognize our revenue in a normal business, right? In a normal business or in a business where you involve in a particular contract in which you receive money or receive full money in advance, even though you haven't performed service, even though you haven't uh, done the things. All right, so that's the ideas behind revenue recognition principles, All right? Now move on to second. Second principle is a matching principle. Matching principle. Now, what does it mean matching principles? Matching principle means sales must be matched with cost. Remember match. Match doesn't mean not equal. It doesn't mean it's equal. It doesn't mean that sales must be equals to cost. No, it doesn't mean that because if sales equals to cost, you have no profit, no loss. All right. Now, what does it mean matching concept? So let me give you example to understand this matching concept. Sale must match with the cost. For example, you produced, you produced 150 units. right and the cost of one unit is a one dollar right you produce 150 products and cost of one product is one dollar right and let's say you sold 100 units and when you sold it sold it you sold at two dollars right now the question is how much profit or how much loss 
So calculate profit or loss, right? So I'm gonna calculate two different profits, all right? And I mean, two different answers. So you have to tell me which answer is correct, your point of view, all right? So let me give you um, example, I mean, situation A. So situation A is sales 100 multiply by two, which is 200, all right? Sales minus cost. So cost is 150 divided by, multiply by one, which is 150, all right? So profit is, so profit is $50. Right? Okay, so let's see it's dollars. Now I'll give you B option B. Option B is sales 100 at two, which is 200. Right? And cost also 100 at one, which is 100. So $100 is profit, all right? Now the question is, which one is correct? Which one is correct, A or B? Can you tell me which one is correct from your point of view? In your opinion, which one is right? A or B? Quickly, tell me, A or B? Say something. Which option better? Which option or which profit is right? $50 profit is correct or $100 profit is correct? Quickly say something, can you hear me, yes or no? Students, can you hear me, yes or no? Say something, can you hear me? Hello? So please say something, can you hear me? Yes or no, say yes, okay. Yes, so, sir. Yeah, so give me your answer, A or B. Just speak, you don't have to raise your hands, just speak. Um, I guess is B. Option B? I Anybody? guess so. Anybody else who think option A? Anybody thinks option A is correct? Right answer is, of course, B. All right, why? exactly because of this principle. This is unfair to match those, I mean, it's unfair to record those kinds of units 
which produce but haven't sold it. All right. According to match, matching principles, your sales units must be matched with your cost units. So that will give us a fair profit or loss because it's a fair. Whatever I'm selling, I am estimating the cost of only those units. I'm not estimating or adding the cost of those units which I haven't sold it. So, so produce 150, sold 100. So 100, 100. Now the question is, where is 50? Where is 50 units? 50 units will be your unsold. And that unsold inventory or unsold product known as closing inventory. The value of closing inventory is 50 multiplied by one, which is $50. So this is your closing inventory. Closing inventory means current assets. Remember in the last lecture, I explained you about the types of assets, account receivable, types of current assets, all right? Account receivable, closing inventory, cash, and maybe prepaid expense, all right? So that's the ideas behind this applying the matching principles to get the reliable. So this is wrong. Option A is not correct. Option B is correct. All right. Why we do that? By following the matching principles sales, since equalizing the sales units to the cost is a fair way to estimating the right profit or loss. All right, if some, some, any other units left, that will be treated as a closing inventory, all right, that we will use in future, all right? That's the ideas behind a matching principles, all right? Now, before we move on to the number three principles, I need to explain you about cost, all right? Cost means, the meaning of cost is a spending money, right? Spending money, spending money known as cost. Remember, you spend money for assets, to buy a machine, to buy equipments, to buy furniture, and so on. And you spend money from other kinds of expenses, purchase raw material, pay salary, depreciation, marketing, advertising, overheads, all right? So these are cost. Spend money on assets, spend money on cost. But what's the difference? Both are spending money, but why we call them assets and why we call them cost. So remember, if any spending money will give you future benefits. Any spend money which give you future benefits, that's known as assets, remember. Any kinds of spend money that do not give you future benefits, no future benefits. That's known as cost. Whatever money you are spending, that will not give you benefits in future. It's just giving you benefits at present or in past, but not in future. Like as assets, machine. I spend money machine. Why I'm spending money on machine? I mean, why I need machine? In future. I use machine to produce product and sell products. It will give you my future benefits, all right? I'm paying salary to my workers. 
I'm paying salary for now, not for the next year. You already work, I pay you salary, finish. I'm not paying you salary now, so you will work next year. You, whatever you have worked for last month, I pay you salary. So salary, cost, machine, assets, all right? Another way to understand assets and cost, remember, cost is your, cost nature is something expired. Right? Something expired. Expired spending known as cost. Unexpired. Unexpired spending known as assets. Unexpired means which whatever money you spend, it has a long life. It will used. Whatever you have spent, it has a already passed, already expired or the time you are making the payments. You make a payments, expire, it's cost. All right, marketing and advertising. Marketing done, advertising done, you pay money. All right, so that's the ideas behind cost. So keep in your mind. So don't be confused between assets and cost. All right, both are spending money. All right, but the purpose is different, all right? Cost, spending money, belongs to income statement. Asset, spending money, belongs to balance sheet. All right, so we will study this thing in future. So just keep in your mind the difference between assets and the cost. Now move on to number three, principle. Number three principle is a full Disclosure, full disclosure. Now what does it mean full disclosure? Disclose means inform, all right? Disclose, inform, to tell, tell someone, that's called disclose. Right? Now what does it mean full disclose? Full disclose means we should disclose those kinds of information in financial statement, which is useful for all kinds of users. I repeat, we should disclose, we should write down or we should disclose, we should disclose those types of financial information which is useful for all kinds of users not just not just shareholders not just shareholders now what does it mean all kinds of users you know that if you talk about users let's say external users because we are talking about financial accounting so let's talk about external users. In external users, we have a different kinds of users that we studied in the last lecture. We have shareholders, right? We have banks, we have customers, we have suppliers, and we have government, all right? So you can see that among all external users, which users known as most powerful users or the users which are providing a huge capital of finance to the company, right? Idea is shareholders. Shareholders known as one of the most, I would say, powerful users among all who's looking for 
really financial information for financial, I mean, for, for, for that particular company. But it doesn't mean that we only focus on this. So let's say supplier, all right? So can we ignore the information which is useful for supplier, but not useful for shareholders? Can we ignore those information? Answer is no. We have to disclose in those information in financial statement that's useful for all kinds of users who has connected with the company. Who gonna make financial decisions using company financial information? We have to think about all. That's another way to understand financial information must be fair. Fair means it should be for all of users, not just only focus on the shareholder because they are giving us finance and we worry more about shareholder future investment in, in, in the company, all right? We have to think about all kinds of users, small users, big users, all right? That's the ideas behind. That's the different, that's the ideas behind full disclosure. In another word, in another word, we can say that disclose means we should write those financial information, those financial information which make difference which make difference, right? Which means if any financial information is different from another kinds of financial information and that's important for users, we should disclose it. But one information is important for all kinds of users, so it doesn't mean that you repeat again and again because it's, you have five users. It doesn't mean that one information you're disclosing five times. No, of course not, because all the users, they're gonna read one financial statement. So if information which is different in nature than the others information and important for the all kinds of users, then we should disclose it. That's another way to understand. But the main idea is do not skip or miss any information which is useful for any kinds of users. All right? So that's the ideas behind principles. All right? Full disclosure principles. So principle is finished. So any question regarding principle? Anybody has any question? Say something. Any question regarding principles? There's something, any question? Yes or no, move on. There's something, move on or what? Any question? Can you hear me? Okay, move on. Uh, can you please give some example about this full information? Which, which example? Of uh, some kind of disclosed information. Okay. For example, example of disclosing information is accounting policy. Accounting policy. Let's say 
in our income statement or in our financial reports, we have inventory. All right, inventory means material. So which method we apply to calculate the value of inventory. So let's say, you know that we have a three methods to apply value, I mean, to estimate the value of inventory, LIPO, FIFO, moving average method, last in, first out, first in, first out, and moving average method. So for example, company is applying FIFO method to calculate the value of inventory. So we must disclose which accounting policy company is applying in order to estimate the value of inventory. So accounting policy is just a ideas because maybe supplier wants to know which methods company apply to estimate the value of inventory, which means cost to estimate the profit, all right? Maybe shareholder wants to know, maybe banks wants to know, but this information is very important. Some of users need this kind of financial information. It's just an example, all right? But this is not only information known as a disclosure, all right? So that's the ideas behind uh, full disclosure. Another example is uh, accounting, uh, we call it operating cycle, how long how long account receivable takes to return money back to the company, all right? Supplier are more in interested to know the cash inflow of company, all right? So company must disclose this kind of information. Company should not ignore about the expectation of supplier towards the company financial information, right? Company must keep in mind the expectation of all kinds of users. Company must treat them, all users, equally in terms of providing financial information, in terms of giving financial information disclosure in financial report. All right? So that's the ideas behind full disclosure. Is it okay? Is it okay? Say something. It's okay. Okay. Move on to the next. Now, principles finished. All right. Next is a third guideline, right? Which is C. So, third guideline is a constraint. As you know, the meaning of constraint is standard is giving us some kinds of flexibilities, all right? In order to implement the accounting standards. That's the meaning of constraint. Now constraint divided into two things, two types of constraint or two types of guideline in relation of constraint we have. First one is materiality. Right, and the second one is uh, conservatism, materiality and conservatism. So let's start with the materiality. First one is a materiality. Now, what, what, what is the meaning of materiality? <clears throat> materiality constraint relates. relates to an item 
which give impact on firm's financial condition. Firm's financial condition. All right. It's related to any kinds of items which give impacts on the firm's financial conditions. All right. So let me give you an example. For example, company has a sales, and you know that sales minus cost to profit, blah, blah, blah. Right? So for example, company has a sales, which is um, 70, 9,532.21 dollars. That's the sale of company. All right. Now the question is, instead of writing this 21 cents, this is 0.21 dollar. Instead of writing this, can I write seven nine five three two point zero zero? Can I do that? Yes or no? Should I should I ignore? Should I ignore? this 21 cents to simplify my accounting information. Can I do that? Can I ignore or not? Say something. Or I should write exactly same. Tell me, can I ignore it or I should write exactly same? Means I should not ignore this point twenty one dollars. Tell me, ignore or not? What do you think? I guess we shouldn't ignore. We should not ignore yes okay anybody else who think we should ignore it anybody who think should not i mean we should ignore it just leave it 21 cents because this one is too small just leave it to make it simple Write like this. Anybody who thinks we should ignore because it's too small? Maybe. Maybe. What does it mean too small if you think maybe? What does it mean too small? Mm -hmm. Okay, let me explain. So let me come back to the answer first. So the answer is, can I write this? Can I ignore it? Answer is yes. I can ignore this 21 cents. Now the question is why? Why I should ignore this 21 cents. The reason is in order to avoid any kinds of mistakes in terms of recording financial numbers. You know that this is kind of 21 cents. These kinds of number may create some kinds of obstacles any, or, or, or may, may face some kinds of problems 
or I would say is, is too, too, too rigid, too strict, too robust. So instead of giving too rigid or robust information, we keep it simple. So make sure when we're recording information, it's easy for us to record and read and present. Easy to read, easy to record, and easy to present. So just ignore any kinds of things which has a too small value. Ignore it. You don't have to strictly follow accounting standard to disclose everything. Remember? According to accounting standards, we should give full disclosure. All right? But as per constraint, you have a, some kinds of flexibility. All right? And make sure that flexibility maintains the quality of financial information. So if I ignore this 21 cents, which is $0.21, it will not decrease the quality of financial information because it's too small. Now, I said too small. What does it mean too small? Too small means this number will not give significant impacts on users decision All right if i won't write this if i write this do you think shareholder lose too much money they have a loss the financial crisis the bankrupts no because this is very very small it doesn't really affect their financial things they don't affect their financial decision because the value is very small compared to this value compared to this value this value is very significant all right now another example instead of writing this can i write 79 thousand dollars i ignore this 532 dollars can i ignore it and i write like this what do you think Can I ignore it? This $532, let's say my sales is $7,532.21. I ignore all these numbers and I'm writing $79,000. Can I do that? Is it okay? Exactly not okay. It's not okay. Why? Because this is not insignificant. This is significant this value is big and which can give significant impact on shareholders decisions all right that's the flexibilities we have but make sure that flexibility maintain the value of financial information maintain the usefulness of financial information if by i will ignore this 21 cents so still this maintain the usefulness but if i ignore this 532 and just writing just ignoring this these last three digits now the quality of financial information or usefulness of financial information is decreased and which is not good all right so that's the meaning of constraint now the question is why we don't do that to make it simplified so easy to understand easy to interpret easy to estimate but if you are writing point to one it's it's creating uh, more problems like it's exactly the same rule apply in mathematics like as in mathematics 79 uh 75 3 2 1 point, uh, 5, 6. instead of writing this i can write 7 5 3 2 2 it's okay why because instead of writing this number if i write this it's okay why because it's much more easy to explain it easy to use this number to predict some number but if you are writing 0.5 if you calculate any future number using this number your calculation gonna be 0.0000, 000 it's, i mean it's quite of quite quite long unnecessary 
uh, things. All right. So exactly mathematical rules we apply in financial situation. But, but, for example, uh, one point two zero dollar. Can I write it one dollar? Can I write like this? For example, I spend some money. For example, I spend some money, let's say on telephone bill, company make a call and company spend 120 cents for telephone bills. So instead of writing $1.20, I write only $1. So which means I ignore 20 cents. Can I do that? Instead of writing $1.20, I ignore 20 because it has a less value. So I'm writing $1. Can I do that? Can I write $1? Yes or no? No. Yes or no? No. Yes, that's right. We can't write one dollar. It's wrong. Why? Because this 20 cents is playing 20% role in this one dollar. Compared to this $1, it is a 20%. All right, 20 cents is a 20% of $1. And 20% of, of that particular value is not a small money. But if you calculate the percentage of $21 of this 7, 9, 5, 3, 2.21, if you calculate the percentage, is gonna be point zero zero something, right? Zero 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 something. So this significant. This is very small. But this is twenty percent. Is not a small number. It's a big number. If you look at here, all right. So that's keep in your mind, all right. When we are recording, we have a kind of flexibilities to record the information. But keep in your mind that information may not decrease the quality of information. May not hiding the important information, may not decreasing the significant value of that particular item, whatever item, it could be income, expense, assets, liability, anything, any event which has the economic value. So make sure economic value do not uh, depreciate, do not uh, devalue, all right? So that's the ideas behind uh, materiality. Did you get the ideas? Materiality, understand? Yes or no? Yes, teacher. Now move on to the last uh, constraint, which is second constraint, which is conserv uh, conservatism. Conservatism. Okay, conservatism concept says that choose any method, any accounting method, accounting policy, any accounting method which do not overstate the value of assets and income. Right? 
choose any method, any kinds of method which do not overstate. Overstate. Now, what does it mean? Overstate. Overstate means more than its actual value. When we are recording more than its actual value, that's the meaning of overstate. If you are recording any kinds of assets which value is it actually less, but we are recording more, which is bad. Because if you're doing that, you are providing fake information to the users. All right? So they think, oh, this company assets value is so high. Very good. We should invest. But actually, assets value is not high. Company overstating the assets value. Same thing with the income. Let's say actual income is $5. In order to show that my, my income statement looks beautiful, instead of writing $5 as my income, I'm writing $7. So $2 overstating. And people think, wow, this company has a high income and they invest a lot of money. But actually, that $7 is not the real number. It's overstated number. It's a wrong number, in other words. All right? So you are giving any kinds of wrong number which give wrong impacts on the users. That's the meaning of uh, overstated value, right? So apply right method. Do not apply any kinds of method that unnecessarily increasing the value of assets and the income. Another way to understand this one, this is the one way to understand conservatism. Another way to understand conservatism is a future expense is present expense, but future income is not present income. What? Okay. Future expense is treated as a present expense. All right. Future expense can be treated as a present expense. So something I'm going to pay in future, I can pay now. I repeat, anything I want to pay in future, I can pay now. But anything I want to sell in future, I cannot record as a revenue now. All right. I repeat again. Any kinds of expense that I need to pay in future, I can pay now and I can record it. All right. Any kinds of revenue, which means selling product, I'm going to sell in future, but I can't record now. All right. So, for example, let's say spending money. I spend money on assets. So I record these assets even belongs to. Sorry, I spend money on assets and I will record. All right as spending money or as unexpired cost right that i explained before but i will use same assets in future to make money to generate revenue but i'm not recording generating revenue right now because revenue hasn't recognized so that's kind of, uh, I would say that uh, it's kind of uh, relations between conservatism and revenue recognition, all right? But uh, the best way to understand is this, in my point of view. This is the best way to, to find out the meaning of conservatism. The future expense is present expense, can be treated as a present expense. We pay and we record as a prepaid expense, 
right? It belongs to future, but we are paying now, right? But future incomes cannot be present income. That's I'm going to earn in future, receive in future, but I, I cannot record it now. All right? So that's the ideas behind conservatism. So let's say, uh, in simple way, to understand this conservatism, we can take as our life examples. So always recognize bad news first. Always recognize bad news first. And once you recognize good news, do not treat as a good until it's confirmed. All right? Bad news. If you do not even confirm bad news even though you do not confirm bad news but if you, you you already assume that it's a bad it's expense for my business but if there is a good news and you do not you should not confirm as a good news until it become true when solid evidence comes to you then we should good so that's uh, that's the, the the way to understand which means uh, we have to bring some kinds of uh, uh, some kinds of uh, reactions toward the negative things first and then the positive things all right we need to react towards the negative thing first and then the positive things why because if negative things not comes true is give you good thing but if negative things becomes true you already make your plan you have negative things you don't know true or not you assume is not true i mean you assume it's true and you make action you make some plans by keeping your mind it's a bad news but we came to know it's not a bad so win-win situation if it's actually bad you made a plan it is not bad to save money. But if good news, and you think, oh, good news, so you're gonna make your plan according to good news, but it's not a good. Eventually, if it's not a good, all plans, gone. All right? So think about bad news first instead of good news. So let me give you one more, uh, more practical example. Like a save money. Why we save money? The reason to save money is in future, in future, if we don't have money, we use this save money, right? Why we don't think that, why we need to save now? Because if now we have money, in future we also have money. So don't need to save money, just enjoy life. We do that? No, we don't do that. So conservatism, it's quite, uh, uh, quite about future unstabilities. Keep in your mind that future is unstable. So focus more on negative, uh, focus more on the things that affect you negatively. Make your plan for those things that can give you, that can give you impacts negatively. Worry about those things. Don't worry about things that's going to give you positive impacts. Make plan for negative actions, negative circumstances. Don't make plan for positive circumstances. Focus more on negative because negative things, negative things can give you financial harms in business. But positive things, not going to give you financial harms. They give you benefits. All right. That's the conservatism uh, constraint. All right. I hope you got the ideas for conservatism constraint. So constraints finish. Operating guidelines now finish. Constraint finish.
So introductions to financial accounting, this is your learning outcome one. So learning outcome one is finished. So in this subject, you're gonna have a four different learning outcomes. So let me check for your, um, for your next uh, session. Okay, so in the next uh, session, uh, learning outcome two, we will study about double entry system. Double entry system, All right? In order to understand this double entry system, your learning outcome one is very important. So make sure you understand this session very well and the previous session very well, especially previous session, because in the previous session, we discussed about assets, liability, equity, income, expense, what inside assets, what inside liability, that's very important, all right? Don't ask me in the next session that teacher, what is the meaning of assets and liability and what is, what is current asset, what is non-current asset, all right? Don't repeat this question. If you wanna know the answer of this question, you have to go back to the, to the previous uh, video. All right for your uh, learning outcome one All right so learning outcome one is finished now ask me question whatever questions you have anybody has any question um teacher what? when we study about learning outcome one do we have to study exactly in the slide which Miss Me sent to us? You mean, what do you mean by exactly study? Um, I mean, the slide which Miss Me sent to what? us. This is the same slides, this information you had in the same slides. You have this information or something else? Um. Miss Me has sent us a slide. I know Miss Me, she has, she already sent you slide, but can you tell me the slide Miss Me, she sent you, that slide has the same information like this or different? Um, it have nearly same, but not same. Uh, anyway, I, I will send you uh, lecture slides again. All right, in case uh, I'm worried if you, by mistake, if you got the slides from the other teachers, but I will send you the slides again, that slides contain nearly that information, all right? But focus more on my class teaching, I mean, online or face-to-face -face teaching. Um, focus less on the lecture slides, all right? Because I covered 80 to 90% with lecture slides, but I don't follow slide by slide or sentence by sentence, otherwise, the session gonna be really boring, all right? So instead of following exact sentence or exact slides, I'm giving you whole ideas or whole picture of your each learning outcomes, all right? So the idea is that make sure you follow these information for exams point of view or any of it. So whatever inf information I'm writing on the board or I'm writing uh, here, that information is very important. Mm, okay, thank so, you, teacher. Uh, I hope next week uh, we're gonna uh, uh, open a school. I mean, school will be open next week, right? I, I hope so. I don't know. I haven't. Yes. Heard. Yeah. So if so, next week when I will, I'll see you in the class. I'm gonna teach in the same way. All right, drawing a diagram or writing on the boards. I may not follow slide by slide. Maybe I will use some slides to show you some calculations, but in terms of theory. I will explain you by writing on the board, all right? Instead of just going slide by slide. Okay, thank you, so, teacher. So, so the idea is that it's very important for all of you to attend my every lecture. It's important, all right? So don't uh, miss or don't be absent in any session. Every session is very important because whatever information I'm giving you, every session that's going to be part of your either midterm exam or performance test or final exams all right so please do not skip any lecture all right 
So uh, until now we have a recording session, yes. but next week, I don't know, we can, you can record from your mobiles, it's up to you, but, but, um, but we don't have another way to record the session when we were, the, uh, when we will be in the classrooms. All right, so, so please um, be present in your class. Right. So any question, any other questions, anybody? Um, teacher, could you please give us your email in case we have some question after the class? Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm giving the email. That's my email, but when you send me email in your uh, email title, you write uh, Bolton, Bolton Financial Accounting, right? You write Bolton Financial Accounting in your email title so I can understand uh, you are from which university because these subjects I also teach some other uh, students too and I'm teaching something different because they have different syllabus, right? So please uh, send me email if you have any question regarding any anything about my this lecture and the previous lecture or upcoming lectures. All right. Okay. Um, thank you, D. So yeah, um, will you send will you send the, the record the lesson slides to Miss Me? I uh, I send her, but what what now? What you can do is whoever is a class monitor. Please send me email on my email address, whoever is the class monitor, and then I will reply to you with the lecture slides. This, 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 this video, previous video, and uh, lecture slides. So you have all information until now. Okay, thank you. So please send me email. Okay. So any other question? That's okay. Everything is okay? If no questions, so can we stop now? There's something, if, if no questions, can we stop now? Yes, okay. So we stop now, I'll see you uh, next week, hopefully in the class, if university open, if it's not, then again, uh, I'll see you online. All right. So uh, I'll see you next week. Thank you. Please send me email. All right.